I will never ask for money. I am not into e-begging, but if you want to support me and my content, you can. I have a Patreon, and I also have channel memberships activated. If you want to support my content, click the button and choose the plan that's right for you. Or if you do not like YouTube's ways of doing things, but still wish to support me, click the link in the description for my Patreon. Then pick a tier that is right for you. Everyone who supports my content will get a shout out at the beginning of each video, as well as other perks like early access to content. Now onto the video. Someone passing away is never funny. In fact, it's downright tragic. It leaves pain and hurt that never goes away. For those who knew Graham Parsons, his passing left a lasting sadness. His friends were so loyal to him that they did the unthinkable, stole his body to honor his final wishes. The story of the theft of Graham Parsons' body would live in rock and roll history as a morbid comedy of errors. Graham Parsons was born Ingram Cecil Connor III on November 5th, 1946, and boy did he not have a good early life. His father ended his own life on Christmas of 1958 when Parsons was 12 years old. His father had been a pilot in World War II and came home with demons he could not overcome. But Parsons took comfort in music and playing music. His mother, though, took comfort of the Southern kind. She drank a lot. As a kid, because of his family being wealthy, Parsons got to meet Elvis, and this meeting in 1956 changed his life forever. He became in love with music. He played in rock and roll cover bands like The Pacers and The Legends. And like all teenagers, his tastes changed over time. At 16, he began listening to folk music. In 1963, he played in a band called The Shilohs. He would play small venues and built his career up which he really didn't have to do if you think about it. He did come from money, as I said. His grandfather owned a third of orange groves in Florida, which is honestly impressive. Too many would use their family connections to become famous, but not Graham Parsons. Still, his family wealth was probably how he got into Harvard, which he didn't stay there long. He got really into country music, mostly Merle Haggard, and dropped out after one semester. Graham Parsons took his stage name from a nickname he had growing up, Obviously, his name is Ingram. What is short of Ingram? Graham. And his stepfather's last name, which was Parsons. By 1965, another tragedy happened. His mother had died of cirrhosis of the liver. But in 1968, he began to play with the birds. This was short-lived. Mostly because he had a friendship with Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. Though Jagger mostly tolerated him. Keith Richards, on the other hand, was really friends with Parsons. And, uh, and Graham being as he was a, a natural soul brother, you know. And it was through Richards that Parsons began to experiment with drugs. Parsons had been a drinker, but around Richards, he took on drugs. And Parsons didn't do anything half-assed. He dived fully into the drug culture to the point that Keith Richards told him he was doing too much. Let that sink in. Keith Richards has probably done drugs we have all never heard of. And he stated that Graham Parsons needed to slow down when his chances with the birds pretty much went away due to the fact that he wanted to hang out with the Rolling Stones and only do that. Graham found himself at a turning point, which is when he got together with some old friends from his early music days and created the Flying Burrito Brothers, which I'm pretty sure that that band name came from LSD. But they were a mix of blues, country, and rock. Their 1969 album, The Gilded Palace of Sin, was a best-selling album, but their second release did not capture the magic of the first album. A couple of interesting facts before I move on. They had been invited to play at Woodstock, but they turned it down, which if they had been at Woodstock, they might have been bigger names. Around the time that he was in the Flying Burrito Brothers, which really quickly, I'm sorry, I am sure they're fans of this band out there, but I cannot say this name with a straight face. But anyways, around the time that he was in the band, he fell in love with Joshua Tree National Park, which looks like this. A hauntingly beautiful yet eerie place. In the 60s, it was a place a lot of people went, took LSD, and just let the environment take them for a ride. He fell so much in love with the place, he wanted his body cremated after death and spread across Joshua Tree. And only a handful of people knew that. One includes his road manager and longtime friend, Phil Kaufman, who has an interesting list of friends himself. Mick Jagger, Graham Parsons, Charles Manson, 
Not kidding, he befriended Charles Manson when they were both in prison in the early 60s. Damn did Charles Manson make a lot of friends in the music industry. That could be a video in and of itself. Anyways, back to Parsons. Graham Parsons decided that after he was kicked out of the band he helped start, that he would go into a solo career. First, with the help of Merle Haggard, he released an album called GP, released in January of 1973. But this album didn't see much success. That is the story of Graham Parsons, a talented singer and songwriter, but most of his fame came after he passed away. But his sound was similar to a band he hated, which was the Eagles. Not wanting to rest on a subpar first outing, he decided to go back to the studio to record a follow-up. And because of Kaufman, he had began working with Emmylou Harris. Emmylou Harris, for those of the younger generation, was a country music singer and songwriter. In fact, the song Love Hurts was performed by Emmylou Harris and Graham Parsons. Though neither wrote the song, it was written in the 1960s by Bolo Bryant and first recorded by the Everly Brothers, which was then butchered by a band called Nazareth. Love hurts. Love I felt the need to say this because I know that there's somebody in the comments section that's going to correct me. Probably something along the lines of how Emmylou Harris or Graham Parsons did not write this song. Which I didn't say that, but to cover all bases, they did not write it. And while they were working and touring together, Harris was able to get Parsons to stop using drugs and stay clean throughout the process. Grievous Angel would be a hit record for Parsons, and the aforementioned Love Hurts was on that record. But the album was released after he passed on. After recording Grievous Angel, Parsons decided he wanted to let loose. He decided to go to Joshua Tree and party the only way he knew how, fast and loose. Michael Martin, Parsons' assistant, Margaret Fisher, Parsons' girlfriend, and Dale McElroy, Martin's girlfriend, all went to Joshua Tree Hotel. Smoking weed, drinking, snorting cocaine, and just letting loose. Phil Kaufman wasn't there, and if he had been there, he would have stopped the drug use as he tried to keep Parsons drug free. Also not there, though she lived in the area, was Parsons' wife. Yep, he was married and he had a girlfriend. But to be fair, the marriage was over and the divorce papers were going to be sent to his wife on September 20th, 1973. The four partied through the night, going from bar to bar in Joshua Tree, smoking weed and doing other types of drugs including barbiturates, cocaine, and drinking. But then the weed ran out, and Martin decided to go back back to LA to get more. And that is when Parsons wanted heroin, which he had also gotten into and had quit when making music with Emmy Lou Harris. But there was no heroin there. They ended up trying to find heroin from one of the locals, but were only able to score something much worse. Morphine. Back at his room with the two ladies he was left with, which to remind you was Fisher and McElroy, Parsons took two doses of morphine and began to OD, which caused the two girls to freak out. Fisher thought the best solution was to, well, she shoved ice cubes up his butt, which I'm sure there's a logical reason for that, but all I can think of is would you feel cold or pain from doing that? I'm not going to shove an ice cube up my own ass to figure this out. I am not that curious. But butt stuff aside, there was no saving him. He passed away from drug intoxication on September 19th, 1973. The amount of morphine Parsons had used was three times the lethal dose. He was 26 years old. When Phil Kaufman heard of the passing of Graham Parsons, he was saddened by the loss of his friend and decided to uphold Graham's final wish. Now comes the part that is more like a comedy than a tragedy. What happened to Graham Parsons' body reads like a dark comedy movie rather than real life. So here we go. Parsons' surviving family had no idea that Parsons wanted to be cremated and his ashes spread over Joshua Tree. For all they knew, he wanted to be interred in his native Georgia or New Orleans where the family moved to. So Phil had little time to decide what to do. So he decided he was going to steal the body of Graham Parsons, drive it to Joshua Tree, and then set it on fire there. Brilliant plan. He got the help of Michael Martin to enact this epic heist. First, they needed to get the body out of Los Angeles Airport as it was getting ready to be put on a plane destined for New Orleans. They borrowed a hearse and pretended to be a mortuary workers. They entered the hangar with a story that the family hired them to transport the body, which confused the cargo workers. Though the manager didn't bother to, one, look into this claim, or two, wonder why two drunk dudes in a hearse were trying to take the body of a rock star, which yes, they were intoxicated. Martin and Kaufman had to drink to calm their nerves. The cargo manager decided, well, this is legit. He had them sign paperwork, which Kaufman signed it under the pseudonym Jeremy Nobody, which I'm sure the cargo manager didn't bother to look, because this is another pretty big red flag. 
Another red flag should have been the two drunk mortuary workers not being able to load a coffin into the hearst, which a cop showed up soon after this and saw this, and then proceeded to help them put the coffin in the hearst. Then watched them back the hearst out of the hangar and accidentally hit the side of the hangar, and the cop did nothing. Kaufman and Martin drove, while intoxicated, to a gas station and purchased five gallons of gas, then made it to Joshua Tree, where they unloaded the casket, and then dumped five gallons of gas inside the coffin onto the corpse, and set it on fire, then got the hell out of there, driving back to LA like madmen, knocking cars off the road. With the deed done, they thought they were in the clear. No one knew it was them. Yeah, but the body was reported missing. But they wouldn't get in trouble, right? So Kaufman and Martin, on their way back to L.A., decided they were too drunk and pulled over. They ended up sleeping off their drunkenness in the hearse that they stole and banged up. Then decided to get back on the road and ended up in a pileup after they rear-ended a car. A police officer came onto the scene as the two got out of the car, and the officer saw the many beer cans that just fell out of the hearse. So he attempted to arrest them, but the two slipped out of the handcuffs and darted away. I know what you're thinking. Well, the police have their IDs, right? Nope. The cop didn't bother to get information from them, so the officer had no idea who they were. Meanwhile, not long after they got out of Dodge after setting Graham Parsons' corpse on fire, they forgot that Joshua Tree kinda normally is full of people, and campers noticed the fire and well alerted the authorities. So Graham's body was found, and police kinda put two and two together that something isn't right here. So they put two and two together, and it led back to the airport, where workers were able to point the finger at Martin and Kaufman. On September 25th, 1973, Phil Kaufman was arrested at his home. Michael Martin turned himself in the next day. So these two had a bumbling misadventure. An adventure that if this was a Hollywood movie, they would get a happy ending. But this is real life. Happy endings rarely don't happen. So this wasn't going to end happily, right? Well, as Sam Jackson once said, hold on to your butts. Just don't shove any ice cubes up it. So, in the 70s in California, stealing a body was not a crime. Oh, the police tried to charge them a grand theft, but there were no laws on the books that suggested stealing a body was illegal. I am really not sure why that is. It has been a law in a lot of states that stealing a dead body was a felony, but apparently not in California. But anyways, they both were found guilty of misdemeanor theft, and that was for stealing the casket. They were both ordered to pay $300 for the casket, a 30-day suspended jail sentence, and ordered to pay up to $708 for the funeral arrangements. Which, to help raise money, Kaufman held a concert, called the Kaufman's Coffin Caper Concert, all starting with the letter K, and it took me five times to say properly. The beer that was served came with an inscription, Graham Pilsner, a stiff drink for what ails you. God, these puns are disturbing. Graham Parsons was returned to his family, and he really didn't get his final wish. Not in the sensible way, anyways. But he was interned at the Garden of Memories in New Orleans. But there's an unofficial monument that was placed on the site where his corpse was set on fire in Joshua Tree. So there's that. And part of him that was burned probably was scattered, so... Technically his ashes were scattered, but technically not. Graham Parsons was a pioneer of a genre that is still popular today. The blend of country and rock. And what happened to his body after his death is one hell of a story. <laughs>